your health is in your hands. Now, perhaps you're thinking, wait a minute, I've come along to a TED talk where I'm meant to hear inspirational and pushing the boundaries idea. But I hear this every time I go to the GP. How, how is that a novel idea? But I don't mean this in the metaphorical sense, but rather literally. There are more mobile devices than there are people on the planet. And every time you pick up your phone, your laptop, your tablet, you're interacting with artificial intelligence, perhaps because you're searching for something on Google, you're uploading a photograph on Facebook, or asking Siri the meaning of life. <laughs> you're already interacting with artificial intelligence, you just may not know it. Now, before I talk about what artificial intelligence is and how these systems crucially learn, I want to talk about what artificial intelligence is not. Please expunge this idea from your mind. <laughs> this is the media's portrayal of artificial intelligence. And it comes about because we anthropomorphize this technology. We try and humanize this digital technology. Artificial intelligence is not the same as human intelligence. These systems don't enjoy this beautiful inner mental world that we have of consciousness. So what is AI? Well, you know, because you use it every day, it's a tool. And since our inception, <laughs> I love this slide, it's my favorite. <laughs> since our inception, we have been master tool makers, culminating in the 1940s with the advent of the computer. Now, for many years, human programmers, people like me who wouldn't get invited to many dinners, would sit behind computers and, <laughs> it's true, um, handcraft code into the machine, instructions to tell it what to do. And we did pretty well. We, we got expert systems, systems that could outwit humans at particular tasks. And it's actually 20 years ago today, by sheer coincidence, that IBM's Deep Blue beat the then world champion Gary Kasparov at his own game, at chess. But then in the 1980s, there was a revolution in computer science. I know it wasn't the introduction of Pac-Man, though that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but rather, the introduction of computer programs that could learn. So how, how can computers learn? Well, actually, the inspiration comes from the most magnificent machine we will ever own, our own brains. So if we think about how infants learn, like this cutie behind me, not my son, but, you know, I've got the image off a, a good website, so it's fine. Um, if we think about how infants learn, they learn from experience. They learn from trial and error. So every time this gorgeous little one goes to play with this game, new connections will form in the brain. And over time, those connections will become more efficient. They'll be able to talk to other parts of the brain better. He'll acquire the motor and cognitive skills he needs to be able to orient the blocks into the right spaces. That's how he's learned. And this is the idea that we do in artificial intelligence. Do computers have experiences? Well, yes, they do. They have data. So what we do is we allow AI systems to learn from data without being pre-programmed. Now, this all might seem a little bit abstract and a bit sci-fi, which I don't want to do. So I wanted to show you what researchers at Google had created an artificial intelligence system to play a 1980s game called Breakout. Now, the only one piece of code in this AI system is the goal. And that goal was to maximize the score on the game. How the computer would get the highest score, what it would need to do, it didn't know. It hadn't been pre-programmed into the system. Now, at 100 games, you can see that it's OK. It's had a bit of experience. It kind of knows what it's doing. But then it gets more experience more data. And at 300 games, you can see that it's kind of at human capabilities. 
It's knowing to move the bat left and right to keep the ball in play, and that will knock the blocks, and its score will go up. And then, quite unexpectedly, they thought, well, let's just leave this overnight, because computer programmers do that, because we're lazy, and <laughs> let's, see what, let's see what happens. And it learnt for itself this optimal solution to use the ball. <laughs> How cool is that? Right? If only I had a brain like that. Um, to drill up the left-hand side and to get the highest score in as few a possible moves as it could. And it's this technology, this ability for computer programs to learn from data, and we're in a, a data-fueled world, where our, we find ourselves in this artificially intelligent world that we now live in. And this technology has revolutionized a number of sectors. Banking, marketing, insurance, and the list goes on. But there's one sector, and in my opinion, the most important sector, where this technology is not being utilized to its full potential, and that is healthcare. Now, we know that our wonderful NHS collects an awful lot of information about us, and they, they either reside in unhackable paper... <laughs> that wasn't me, either. Um, unhackable paper files like this, or in disparate clinical systems that don't necessarily talk to each other. So the compelling question is how do we develop and deploy artificial intelligence systems to learn from our data, to ultimately help our, very, our struggling NHS system, our healthcare system? And I want to be really clear here. When I say deploy, I do not mean replace our wonderful doctors, nurses, therapists, but rather give them tools, artificial intelligence tools, to make their working lives more proficient and ultimately let them care for patients because that's why people joined the NHS. Now, one million of us use our NHS every 36 hours, and for the vast majority of us, we receive world-class care. But sadly, for one in ten of us during hospital admission, we will undergo a medical error or a medical harm. And research indicates that one in 20 deaths in hospital is preventable. So how can we start to use the digital technologies that you probably, hopefully, aren't playing on now, but have in your pockets to reduce these figures and help our healthcare system? One way is digital health. We all probably have mobiles on us right now, and those mobiles may be very useful, for example, in ordering on Sainsbury's, or if you're in a slightly higher tax bracket, Waitrose, and, um, and also in our dating. So these apps are everywhere, but we don't use them in our healthcare. Why not? They're very simple to use. And it's this idea, only last month, that the NHS adopted. They developed this website, which is a digital tool for people with a multitude of long-term conditions. You can see here, for example, diabetes, dementia, cancer, living in the community to use these apps to help them manage their condition. And I want to just take a, a deep dive into one of these apps, which was developed by researchers and clinicians at Oxford University. Now, patients were given a tablet, not a medical one, one like this. Thanks, that was a proper pun. Uh, um, they were given this in their own homes, and they were given a probe to pop on their finger, and every day that, that probe would read data about that patient, vital signs like heart rate, the amount of oxygen in the blood, and over time, that system, the artificial intelligence system, under the hood of this app, would learn about this patient. Because even though you, me, may have a diagnosis, we are all different. Our diagnosis is one thing, but we are, might be very different in the way we react and the way we integrate with our, with our condition. So what do these apps allow for? Well, I argue that they allow for a more proactive rather than reactive healthcare system. 
So let's think about if we had a fictional patient with, for example, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, affects 3 million people in the UK, long-term condition, and they became acutely breathless. What options do they have at the moment? Well, they could ring NHS 111 to get advice, or they could ring 999, understandably. Both of those options would probably culminate in an ambulance being dispatched, then being rushed to the local a &E hospital, being admitted. Patients don't want to be in hospital. They want to be empowered in their own health and how they look after themselves. But let's say that these apps were being used. Well, that would allow for a proactive healthcare system rather than a reactive one, because these apps, for example, this particular one, is able to predict ahead of time way before the patient starts to notice breathlessness feelings, that they're becoming unwell and they're on this trajectory of health deterioration. And what this app can then do is alert the clinical team, so the patient's doctor or respiratory nurse, I think you need to check on this patient. And so we then start to get personalised treatment plans, because as I said, no two patients with COPD are the same. Now, this particular app has been running for 12 months and has shown really promising results. Patients using this app in Oxford, there's been a reduction of 17% of hospital admissions and 28% of GP visits have been reduced. But that's a stat. That's, that's not important. What's important is that patients were empowered in their own health. They literally had their health in their hands, and they were a collaborator with their clinical team through this digital technology to look after themselves. Now, the second example is one very close to my heart. I have for 25 years now, no, I don't look it, uh, type 1 <laughs> diabetes. And a, a worry for patients like me is, is eye, uh, sight loss. So patients like me are 25 times more likely to suffer sight loss and eventual blindness. If caught early enough, 98% of these cases could be prevented. So what's the current state of play? Well, an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor, will take a picture like this of the back of my eye. This isn't the back of my eye, thankfully. But, and will start to trawl through these scans, looking for features or characteristics that indicate that I have diabetic eye disease. Now, this is a very, very time-intensive thing for a doctor to do. And we kind of have a perfect storm at the moment because we have very few ophthalmologists. It takes a long time to become a consultant eye doctor. But at the same time, the number of people being diagnosed with diabetes in the UK is rapidly rising. So a leading hospital in London, Moorfields Eye Hospital, teamed up with Google, DeepMind, and said, can we train an artificially intelligent system to read these scans. Now, this hasn't been integrated into the NHS. It's still in a, a research phase. But if it were successful, what are the kind of benefits it could give us? Well, it would be able to triage patients according to their need. So at the moment, d doctors see scans, and they don't know what they're going to see. So a patient might be 99th in the row that is probably going to go blind in the next month versus someone he's looking at or she's looking at at that particular day. And it will take him a long or her a long time to get to that patient that is really in need of their treatment. But because, as we saw earlier, we, we don't turn off these systems. They can run all night. They don't go on annual leave. They can start to um, triage these patients according to need. Now, again, as I said earlier, we're not replacing doctors, but rather streamlining their workloads so that the right patients are seen at the right time. So, with all this wonderful technology that we have available and we're trying to infuse into the NHS and into our healthcare system, there are big players moving into this space. Google, Microsoft, as we know. IBM, and this ecosystem is growing rapidly. So should we be concerned? Now, it's my opinion that we need to partner with third parties for the NHS to continue to offer world-class care, particularly under the operational and financial pressures it currently finds itself in. But there are ethical and regulatory concerns that we need to discuss in public forums like this. 
For example, only yesterday, as I'm sure we all know, there was a cyber attack on NHS systems. If we're sharing data between the NHS and other, other operational systems, for example, let's say in KPMG or IBM or wherever, how do we make sure that that data isn't hackable? If we give our data to private companies, who owns that data and what can they do with it? How do we ensure that our healthcare data, unlike our Facebook data, doesn't become a monetized commodity? For example, I don't want to go onto the internet and be, you know, looking at the latest cat video and, and I mean, do my work and, <laughs> and this is recorded, right? And um, start to see advertisements for diabetic-related products. I'd find that really spooky and very intrusive. And we heard earlier that these artificial intelligence systems can allow doctors be, and other members of the clinical team to be more effective in their diagnoses. But what happens, because no system is perfect, even a digital one, when the system gets it wrong, when it misses that cancerous growth? From a legal perspective, who is responsible? Me, the developer, the doctor, or the system itself, which, as I said earlier, isn't human? Where is this grey gray area? And we need to discuss this as a society. So it would be remiss of me as a data scientist not to predict something. And <laughs> how do, if we're, if we're able to tackle these very important and I think game-changing questions, where do I see the, this new algorithmic healthcare landscape passing? What will it look like? Well, I think if we do this properly and effectively and in collaboration with the NHS, then Paradoxically, our NHS could actually become more human, more personal, because doctors, nurses and therapists' time will be freed up. And no algorithm or artificial intelligence system can comfort you or be there for you when your worst fears are confirmed. Empathy is and I believe, will always remain a uniquely human trait. Thank you for your time.